So, thank you. Um, and uh, I guess that uh, the NIMAL uh, should have considered, particularly having so many um, or, or a significant presence of Mediterranean people in the group, the, the siesta consideration. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we do not have that very sexy video that, uh, that SDIL has prepared. We'll, we'll try to do our best. Uh, okay. So uh, I'll, I'll talk about NIMAL, uh, Nutritional Immunology and uh, Molecular Medicine Laboratory. I'll also talk uh, a little bit, since it's uh, so essential to NIMAL, uh, about uh, the Center for Modeling Immunity to Enteric Pathogens. Uh, but both uh, efforts are um, leading towards a common goal, uh, which is applicable to these and, and other projects that have matured and uh, left BVI and left Virginia Tech but are still ongoing, and is to develop safer cures for human diseases. So our focus is not to develop tools, it's not, uh, we are not, and I'll start by saying that, we are not a mathematics laboratory, we are not a computer science laboratory, uh, we are not an immunology laboratory, we are a laboratory that is intended to solve problems. However, in order to be able to solve those problems related to human health effectively and efficiently, we use tools in computer science, uh, through internal expertise or through collaborations uh, with other groups at BVI, such as NDSSL, um, to advance new products into the market or to understand mechanisms of action uh, that will eventually help advance those products uh, into the market. So we, in order to accomplish that, we have a diverse expertise within the group, and, and I'll talk briefly about the, the senior people within the team, and they'll, uh, they'll participate in the question and answer session. Uh, we have uh, Raquel Fontecillas, uh, who is an, an immunologist with expertise in mucosal immunology. She leads the um, immunology efforts within the Center for Modeling Immunity to Enteric Pathogens. Um, Stefan Hoops uh, leads the bioinformatics and software development efforts uh, under MIP. And uh, there's a new addition in the team, uh, Vida Vedi, who is, uh, has expertise in computer engineering and also uh, molecular medicine. So she brings together both areas uh, that we are pursuing within NIMAL to advance modeling immunity to enteric pathogens as, as well as other projects that ultimately will help understand and develop ways to improve human health. Um, the, the NIMAL is therefore a multi-PI group using transdisciplinary approaches to advance uh, human health and develop uh, new therapies. Our approaches consist on, and they are very similar to the approaches that have been presented earlier in the day. Uh, in this case, I'm defining this slide as a systems immunology approach, by which we start uh, approaching a problem by a thorough analysis of what is known about the problem. We like to reflect on the past and build our questions on that past. We articulate those uh, questions, both theory and data, around uh, computational and mathematical models. Uh, we run simulations, and we utilize those simulations then to guide uh, the experimentation. And actually, the most important piece, in my opinion, is the validation of those computational predictions, which luckily, since our subjects are mice, pigs, and eventually humans, we have the opportunity to validate those uh, predictions. In order to um, work on this abductive cycle, uh, we are using um, tools such as Complex Pathway Simulator, other tools developed um, uh, in NIMAL and in collaboration with NDSSL, such as Enteric Immunity uh, Simulator. And those tools allow us to examine problems related to human health at uh, several scales of spatiotemporal magnitude. Silky this morning presented a very narrow scale uh, of one cell and the problem of cell division and, and cell proliferation. And she alluded to the fact that the human body actually has about uh, 30 trillion cells. We do not pretend to model the entire human body, but we pretend, and in fact, we 
do, model the parts of the human body that are relevant to understand human disease and advance the development of novel therapeutics for that human disease. So at the bottom layer, we have the tissue level. In our case, we work a lot with intestine in the context of infectious disease and immune-mediated disease. The cell-cell interaction layer, uh, the cytokine, chemokine level layer, and then the intracellular layer. And the intracellular layer drives the decision of the cells to uh, become pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory and therefore drive key decisions that will result in lesion development or resolution of infection. And we have added recently, uh, with the expertise of uh, a new member of the team, a top layer, which is a, an automated uh, means of extracting knowledge for, from existing literature through latent semantic analysis and ontology mapping that will allow us to uh, accelerate the building of those initial networks that will be the basis for the theory and the data of, of those models. Some figures uh, uh, and data, some food for thought, uh, we have accounting uh, students and other personnel, about uh, 40 members in the lab. Uh, over the years, we've generated about uh, $12 million in funding. Uh, we have over 100 publications, 20 patents. Uh, our website uh, seems to be quite visited. About 55K uh, people have been visiting our website over the last few years. We generate a tremendous amount of data. A lot of this is from animal models. Uh, my speak, some of it is uh, from humans. In collaboration with NDSSL, we are simulating models that scale up to 10 to the 8. Um, we've utilized over 50,000 mice over the course of the years here at Virginia Tech, about several hundred pigs, have uh, trained and mentored about 150 undergraduate students, and last year we hosted uh, a workshop in computational immunology for the modeling immunity for biodefense program that had about 70 participants. Uh, Stefan was reminding me earlier today that COPASI is being downloaded about 10,000 times a year. So the tool is uh, highly utilized. Some of the aspects of the research going on uh, within nutritional immunology and molecular medicine are uh, presented in our website, and some of them have been uh, very active uh, in uh, previous years and are not as active now, uh, but continue to uh, be meaningful in terms of application. The two current areas that are most active are infectious diseases and computational immunology, because those are the two areas that are um, supported under modeling immunity to enteric pathogens. But in the past, we've done significant progress in chronic diseases, particularly obesity and type 2 diabetes, where we've developed products that are now advancing towards the commercialization pipeline. And of course, the start of the lab was in nutritional immunology. I'll talk about that later in a more uh, specific slide. But we started NIMAL in 2002, uh, studying how uh, nutritional interventions modulate the immune response. Particularly, we wanted to understand how uh, lipid molecules would modulate the balance between inflammation or inflammatory responses in the gut and anti-inflammatory responses. We've learned that some of those naturally occurring compounds can be modified and be made more potent, and we've utilized that information then to advance a pipeline of uh, new therapeutics that are applicable to both um, chronic inflammatory diseases such as diabetes as well as uh, immune-mediated diseases such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Uh, this is one, an example of some of the approaches we've utilized uh, through molecular modeling on uh, some of the targets of interest in the lab. Uh, Lanthionine synthetase like 2 is one of the recent targets. Uh, previously, we did a significant amount of work on peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma. And more recently, we are interested in not, not like receptor X1. What's common in these two molecules is that when they are hit with the right um, naturally occurring substance or the right drug, we are eliciting an anti-inflammatory response. And that is relevant to infectious disease, uh, to maintain uh, tissue health, for instance, during the uh, infection with H. pylori or Clostridium difficile, and that's even more important in the context of immune-mediated diseases.
Um, the nutritional immunology area is the area we started with. Uh, we uh, started to investigate nutritional immunology in combination with mucosal immunology, which is one of the recurrent themes under modeling immunity to enteric pathogens. We did not start mucosal immunology efforts in an infectious disease setting. We started those efforts in a, uh, an autoimmune disease setting. But uh, what's important is that the gut is a very sophisticated organ that uh, needs to be designed and have the, the right characteristics to allow nutrients to come in, be absorbed, be digested without eliciting immune responses. And at the same time, uh, it needs to have the protective actions to prevent pathogens uh, to uh, infect that mucosa. And so understanding how the immune system in the gut operates, understanding those mechanisms allows us to uh, either maintain health in some cases or prevent infectious disease, or in some cases live with infectious disease. And I uh, hope that later on under the question and answer session, we'll have an opportunity to discuss some of the examples of pathogens that may be viewed in some occasions, and that's a theme that, that has um, uh, has been brought up earlier in previous discussions, certain organisms that can be pathogens or can be commensals. In other words, in some cases, they, they can exert uh, detrimental effects versus positive effects. And one of such organisms is Helicobacter pylori. Uh, in the context of immune-mediated diseases, our efforts have been very applied, and the rationale for uh, having very applied efforts is this pipeline, this arrow, shows us the failure of treating immune-mediated disease in the US and worldwide. Uh, current therapies against inflammatory bowel disease are uh, not very efficacious and have significant side effects. This is the, the line of attack that MDs utilize to deal with an autoimmune disease uh, without a cure, Crohn's disease. And the most efficacious therapy is biologics. Um, Biologics cost about uh, 20K per year for that patient affected by uh, Crohn's disease, and it, they work in an amazing uh, rate of 30%. So it's 20K investment, 30% return. I think that that brings a good point that there's a need for safer and more effective therapies, and, and we've utilized some of the targets that we've identified and studied and can manipulate pharmacologically and nutritionally in order to be able to develop those uh, better therapies, uh, either nutritionally or pharmacologically. Uh, the infectious disease research in the lab is centered today under modeling immunity to enteric pathogens, and the major focus is studying Helicobacter pylori infection. Helicobacter pylori is a stomach, a stomach pathogen. It affects about 50% of the world population, and uh, only in about 10 to 15% of the cases, H. pylori causes trouble. And that trouble can be very severe. Uh, that severity ranges from lymphoma to gastric cancer. And so when it causes damage, it results in life-threatening disease. But in the majority of the population, H. pylori causes no problem at all. And it is not understood uh, what are the mechanisms that uh, regulate this balance between um, H. pylori as a pathogen versus H. pylori as, as a commensal or possibly beneficial organism since H. pylori infection is indirectly related to inflammatory bowel disease, the disease that I alluded at earlier, uh, asthma, and uh, in some cases, obesity and type 2 diabetes. So we have an organism, when we are colonized with this organism, we may have protection against chronic disease, but if we are unlucky and our immune system turns the bad way, then we may develop cancer. So it's, it's a matter of probabilities, and we want to understand the mechanisms that shape this response towards cancer versus uh, regulation and anti-inflammation and therefore benefit in immune-mediated diseases to develop better therapies. And that has been uh, the, the core effort uh, of MIP through computational modeling and experimentation and will continue to be the effort over the next few years. This is uh, a slide alludes to some of the older research that uh, was conducted in uh, about 2007. So I guess that was pre-VVI uh, research, but it's still very relevant because uh, this pipeline of, of products uh, continues to be developed. And it, it relates to one of the naturally occurring compounds that we identified to have um, very potent insulin 
sensitizing activities. In other words, it exerts potent anti-diabetic effects. The, the compound is called abscisic acid and uh, is found in plants. But it turns out the amounts of abscisic acid found in plants are not sufficient to exert anti-inflammatory or anti-diabetic effects. However, if we provide higher doses in a highly controlled setting in, in mice with diabetes and obesity, we see a remarkable efficacy that is similar to some of the top selling medications currently in the market. That's a comparison between abscisic acid and Abandia in a mouse model of type 2 diabetes. Computational modeling is a central piece of uh, effort under uh, nutritional immunology. We build uh, multi-scale modeling platforms and uh, with support of NDSSL and others, we have uh, been able to develop uh, high-performance computing-driven uh, computational and mathematical models. And uh, we define those models to be predictive and validated by experimental data. This is a paradigm that uh, represents the integration of our computational modeling efforts and experimentation. On the horizontal axis, we have models, tools, and technologies. On the vertical axis, we have data, metadata, information, and knowledge. And what this figure represents is that you truly need both working uh, in parallel in order to be able to not only research the past, but also absorb the present and reflect on the future. And I would add, based on the track record of MIP, predict the future as it relates to mechanistic understanding of infectious and immune-mediated diseases. So um, we, we developed these uh, predictive, validated computational models, and we are hoping to apply the technology that has been highly successful under modeling immunity to enteric pathogens to accelerate drug development, basically accelerate uh, the path to cures in a chronic disease or an immune-mediated uh, disease uh, setting. This is uh, a slide, this, this taken from our website, represents something that I believe is quite unique in NEMO, and that is the profound integration of experimental and computational aspects. We are not only doing modeling, we are not only doing experimentation, but we uh, combine modeling and experimentation to better understand human health and develop uh, cures for uh, widespread and devastating human diseases. And you can access our website if you are interested at uh, www.nimal.org. So uh, I want to put uh, more emphasis on the question and answer session. And, and there are some questions that uh, we want to uh, favor over the next few minutes. So I would want to ask Vida, Raquel, and Stefan to join me in the panel. I'll be moving the slides. Um, you said earlier that H. pylori um, affects 10 to 15% of the people who have it negatively. Um, is H. pylori a good or bad bacteria, and how is this related to personal medicine? I think that Raquel can answer this question. Okay, for me. okay so um, I think there's already been a little bit of discussion on that, but okay, so I don't know if you can see. But so uh, my opinion with all the information I have and been studying H. pylori for about five years is that it's a good bacteria. So I think um, people infected with H. pylori will develop some kind of uh, gastritis, which is like um, inflammation of the stomach, but that goes without any symptoms. However, and Joseph has mentioned this, 15% will eventually develop um, ulcers and 2%, I think, will develop cancer. So what you can see here is um, that, um, like a map showing the prevalence of H. pylori, uh, the relevant information is that H. pylori has, uh, the, re the prevalence has dropped very significantly over uh, the past years. So even though 50% of the world's population carries H. pylori, um, in the past, it was about 90%. So for the 75% of people who will not develop any significant disease, uh, what it's believed currently is that they have some benefits, and those are that they are protected from, um, I think it's asthma, obesity, and in general, diseases that have an inflammatory component. So 
Uh, the important message about this is that the 50% of us, because I think um, probably most of us in this um, room uh, don't carry the bacteria, we have lost um, protection and we are exposed to other kinds of diseases which uh, have been increasing very significantly. And um, I think the current um, protocols is that if a person goes to the doctor and is diagnosed or as, a, as an H. pylori carrier, is going to undergo um, antibiotic therapy to eradicate it. So this goes back to uh, the, how health is influenced by, um, by the environment. So H. pylori is just one of the bacteria that we know that by not being present, uh, leads to other diseases, and as I said, this is, it's just one of uh, the bacteria that may be in this group. To follow up on Your mic. Your mic is not on. Oh, it's not on. Okay. Um, to follow up on that question, how can we do better than just using aggressive antibiotics to treat H. pylori or similar mm -hmm. pathogens? Sure. Because uh, using strong antibiotic is probably not preferential mm -hmm. in many cases. So can you elaborate on that? So, I mean, I assume that everybody in the audience is aware You can repeat the question. Of, uh, the question is, uh, what, are, what are the alternatives to the use of antibiotics to treat H. pylori or other infectious diseases? So everybody's aware that um, Excessive use of antibiotics has led to many other problems like antibiotic resistance. So in the case of H. pylori, I think it's more whether you want to treat it or not. In other diseases, like for instance, um, C. diff, um, Clostridium difficile associated disease, uh, the prevalence is increasing very significantly, is associated with <clears throat> Again, the use of antibiotics and uh, people staying in hospitals. So an alternative to this is, for instance, using fecal transplantation. So it's basically restoring the microbial environment in the intestine. Uh, for other infectious diseases, like, for instance, influenza, for which we don't have um, effective antivirals, another approach is to use uh, host-targeted uh, interventions, so really target um, the host so that it can, um, in the case of influenza, as I said, um, you can get rid of the virus more effectively or you can recover from the inflammation that is associated with it. So basically, those are the two ways. Are there any other questions? You talked about both modeling and experimentation in the presentation, so I was just wondering how modeling can help experimentalists and clinici clinicians, and how can clinicians and experimentalists help the modeling? I think that may be a question for Stefan. At least I can take uh, the shot at this, answering this from the modeling side. And I think you make an point, the, this uh, point already in their question, you're saying how can the experimentalist help the modeler and how can the modeler uh, help the experimentalist? And I think that working together uh, can address already some of the frustration we've heard earlier this morning about uh, the modelers or the analysts complaining not enough data and uh, the other being frustrated that the data cannot be used. So in our case, it's, this, it's important that we work together it's, uh, we are working together in building the model, we are working together in designing the experiment so that the data we can get is valuable for the model. And once we have a model, we make predictions, and uh, these predictions, uh, in a good case, are validated. In a bad case, they are not validated. However, from my point of the model, the last one is an interesting case because that tells me that my model was wrong and I have to work on it. And uh, from the uh, standpoint of publication, the first one is a good case. So, but uh, in either case, whether that model is validated or falsified, uh, the new data uh, is used to improve the model. And with a better model, we have 
better predictions, better experimentation, and we increase the knowledge discovery as a team. That's how I see it. Um, I just have another question. Um, so what kinds of, what types of models do your uh, tools support? Uh, we have actually a suite of tools which we use in the lab. Uh, there are process uh, tools which are uh, simulating processes like chemical reactions, uh, gene expressions, uh, protein folding, uh, complex building. Uh, those, those we would, uh, for those we would use a tool like Copasi, which is a standard tool available for download on VBI and everybody can use it, uh, that allows stochastic and deterministic modeling. Uh, often, if you start building models, you have knowledge about interactions like upregulation, downregulations of genes, proteins. In that case, we have a tool which is called Plant Sim Lab, which is actually a discrete modeling tool where you just specify information of upregulation, downregulation, and maybe just on and off. So it's a very low level a tool to start thinking in a mechanistic way. And uh, on the other end, we have uh, a multi-scale modeling tool, or agent-based modeling tool, uh, the INISI tool suite, which is, has an HPC component, which we heard already about, which can do 10 to the power eight agents. And uh, here you see actually a visualization of uh, such uh, analysis. Uh, analyzed data or created data. So we cover at least a bright, wide spectrum of models with our tools. And uh, several of those are freely available. Any additional questions? Have you run any clinical trials to test your therapeutics or nutritional compounds? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll address that question. We've, we've run a clinical trial that was uh, funded by a company um, in Crohn's disease patients. Uh, our earlier research uh, focused on a target called proxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma. That uh, receptor uh, is the main target of type 2 diabetes medications, one of which is the, um, the current drug used, which I compare with abscisic acid, and I presented in the previous figure. Uh, what we found is that uh, that uh, receptor could be modulated by fatty acids, and if we did so, we would improve outcomes, health outcomes, in the context of uh, Crohn's disease. So we ran a clinical study, and uh, the preliminary data for that study was, was quite promising. Uh, the, the downside to that is that um, PPAR gamma activating uh, compounds have a kind of a negative reputation because uh, the, the family of compounds that are used for type 2 diabetes have uh, side effects which can be quite devastating, including myocardial infarction. So we decided to move away from the PPAR gamma pathway and we've been focusing on, on the other targets that, that we've discussed earlier. Obviously, the, the opportunities that we see in terms of uh, clinical trial are not just recruiting patients and assessing immunological outcomes and how those immunological outcomes correlate to health and, and, and disease, but uh, going beyond that and, and running in silico clinical studies that are built on uh, a strong immunology data so that we are able to predict the outcome of drugs in silico before we begin to recruit the patients. And maybe Peter can, can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, is on right now. Uh, so to expand on that, we are trying to use the clinical, the results from the clinical study to generate in silico population or virtual population of patients uh, with different degrees of the disease and apply these drugs on them so that we can better understand um, the, uh, how the drugs behave on the population and also have more predictive power in terms of inclusion criteria, what type of um, patients are more likely to benefit from the drugs, and so on. So that's the next step to uh, advance the clinical trials faster toward actually reaching uh, to the real population, so to test the safety as well. OK, 
Okay, is there any other question? How is NIML's re research helping to create new cures to human diseases? Yes, and I think that we can recognize our limitations. Uh, NIML is a research laboratory uh, within uh, a university setting, and so we are very well set up for uh, studies that address mechanism of action, that discover new biomarkers and therapeutics, such as the LA and CL2, to build math mathematical models to validate those models. Uh, we believe that the next step uh, for developing therapeutics needs to be done in organizations that are, have been set up as such. And in fact, there's um, a spin-off company that stemmed from uh, NIMAL in 2008 that has licensed the intellectual property from Virginia Tech in order to be able to advance some of the compounds into the market. And so it is something beyond the walls of, of this, but uh, of this institution, but it's something that is going on, and it's going on very actively. Great. Well, thank you very much, Joseph, and the rest of NIML. Um, please round of applause for a wonderful presentation and a really informative question and answer session. It's very appreciated.